Hello and welcome everyone back to another episode of Dirt to Dust presented by Outlaw Offroad. And you might notice something a little bit different this week. We're both back. We are back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb's back. I'm back. Man, I'm glad to be back in the saddle again. Uh, I almost forgot what you look like, forgot what you sounded like. I'm like, oh, who's this dude who's on this? my computer? I, I feel like I recognize him. And then, well, you know, once you told me, you're like, hey, man, don't don't you know me? Then I realized who it was. And glad to be back again. Glad to be back uh, in the studio, Looks getting like ready to do little, another podcast tan with yourself. You. Um, <laughs> okay, I don't tan. I'm a well, ginger. You got some sun for sure. How, well, okay. So funny story. I actually stayed sunscreen. So I was on a cruise. I was in Mexico, Honduras, Belize, and I sunscreened up every day. We were out. The weather was beautiful. It was a great trip, and I successfully stayed unsunburned. We got back Saturday night, and I said, hey, let's go out to the Greensboro Grasshoppers. is a local minor league baseball team here, uh, here local to me. And I said, let's go to the baseball game. That'll be something cool to kind of chill out and relax. And we sat in the sun, and I didn't wear sunscreen, and I got sunburned. So- <laughs> 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 I, I, I can't. And I thought about it, too. I was like, you know what? I'm going to be that one idiot who goes on vacation in the freaking Caribbean, comes back great. Like, I was good. And gets, I mean, it wasn't really a sunburn, but I definitely got the sun sitting on the first baseline oh, <laughs> yeah. at the Greensboro Grasshoppers ball game. But, hey, the Grasshoppers won. It was a good game. The cruise was great. And, you know, got back into it a little bit, getting back into it this week. And, um, yeah, I was pretty pretty looking forward to getting another episode down and getting back into the episodes, getting back into the mailbag. So just happy to be back here on, on camera with you. And I say it's time to... No, uh, no more delays. Let's keep the uh, let's let's stop. Jump. Let's don't make the people wait. Let's get another episode yeah. going here. Let's jump right into it. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? <laughs> This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt Dirt to to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, all right. So let's get right back into today's Dirt to Dust podcast episode. Our topic today, uh, since we are back together, we can actually have a little bit of a conversation. And and we don't have an interview this week, although I'll tease it a little bit. We do have another one already lined up. It's already scheduled. It's coming uh, probably next week, actually talk about that a little bit later but today's topic is going to be overlanding versus off-roading what is overlanding versus how is it compared to off-roading all of that good stuff and i know that there is i don't know that there's a lot of question of like what maybe there is what's better what's not i do know as i kind of get a little bit older (laughs) i like the overlanding thing a lot more and i do think there's a big market for it and it certainly got huge Certainly got huge during COVID. And yeah, but really, I think it started, I want to say it was really starting to take off a decade ago. Oh, for sure. Um, but, but something I, I think everyone would like to know, because um, you've always got this debate like off roaders versus overlanders, and there's always memes about it. And everyone's like, oh, well, I'm an overlander. And I like overlanding. And everyone's like, I like rock crawling. And then rock crawling guys don't like the overlanding guys. And the overlanding guys think the rock crawling guys trash the the, the earth. And I, don't know. I think uh, a little bit of overlanding versus off-roading and maybe explain the differences and maybe see how they are more alike than not. Uh, plus the different kind of vehicle style builds. I think those are good things to touch on. Um, kind of clarify some, some questions. I know that at least pertaining to the interwebs, uh, people tend to search. For. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's funny that over, I think most of it, and I say this having been on both sides, I think it's mostly rock crawlers making fun of overlanders. I think overlanders just want to be left alone and not be a part of the world <laughs> in general. And, but then, yeah, you, I've, I've heard overlanders, you know, complain about rock crawlers, what they do to trails. And I'm like, overlanders, you're not even on those trails. Like, 
and that's not an offense to overlanders, but overlanders don't like rocks by and large. And and rock crawling guys don't like dirt roads. So like right. you guys don't even generally see the same stuff as each other. So uh I personally think both can live in harmony. I've done both. I continue to do both. Um, you know, we 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 even do what we call race landing. I mean, I kind of overland it at Ultra Four races. Oh yeah. You know, if we get a race that's out kind of in the middle of nowhere, we stack the rooftop tent on top of the the, the you know the tow rig and we go out and I'm you know I got a rooftop tent and a drawer system and all that and I just I camp at the races like I mean it's not yeah. true overlanding I get it but I mean it, it is vehicle based camping even though I'm not moving so I, I definitely see the positives to both yeah, it qualifies as overlanding and we call it's race landing it's race, race landing, landing. it's like race it. landing and I like well, it so we'll get into the different uh, for sure <laughs> the different uh, how whatever nicknames there or you know whatever we're going to designate these things here in a little bit because that's mm -hmm, actually one of my mm -hmm. questions on here so uh first of all like i guess let's for those who are in, in dark ages still like what would you say is like a high level overview is like what is overlanding i mean really it's gotten i think the definition of it's gotten kind of very narrowed and it shouldn't be in the last few years or everybody when they thinks overland they think you know a uh a Toyota Tacoma or a Jeep Gladiator or a Colorado or something. And it's got to have a rooftop tent on it. And it's got to have, you know, an awning and it's got to have, you know, 33s or 35s. And I, I, and I get that, like, that is a cool overland build. I've owned those. I've had those. I've, I've gone out and, and overlanded in those. But I think at the most basic definition I can think of is vehicle based adventure camping. And that's really all I mean. You're, you're everything you need is in your vehicle and you're moving. Right. So if you know, we can load up a vehicle, we all did this in the 80s and 90s. Some of us are older than others. So some did it in the 90s. Some did it in the early 2000s. But when I was a kid, we'd throw everything in the car. We'd throw everything in the van. We'd throw everything in the whatever we had. And we'd go to a camping ground, a campground. Mm -hmm. And we would stay there for a Friday night, Saturday night, whatever. That is car camping. That is not adventure based. That is not what I'm talking about when I say overlanding. But if you're, if you're quote unquote overlanding, you're not in the same place every night. I think you're moving, mm -hmm. you're seeing stuff, you're traveling during the day. And that vehicle is designed to be mobile, but also kind of everything you need in it. Now, that does not mean that you have to have a rooftop tent in it. You can have, you can go to Walmart and get, you know, whatever you want. You got your tent in there. I've seen plenty of guys overland out of the back of a forerunner. There is no rooftop tent. There is no nothing. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen crazy builds with, you know, a Patriot camper and, and, you know, cool fridges and all that. But I think, Anything in between that, I consider overlanding. If you're going out, it's adventure-based camping, it's vehicle-based, everything's all in the vehicle. That, to me, is overlanding. Yeah, for sure. And that can even, I would say, encompass, there's a huge movement right now of, like, van camping or car camping. Um, Hashtag van life. Van life. Um, yep. But a lot of these guys and girls are are actually, I'm seeing more and more often that it's more than just urban camping in your vehicle. They're actually getting mm -hmm. off the pavement, off the trail, um, actually just a couple, I want to say a couple weeks ago, a whole group of, um, guys from California loaded up on what looked like hand-built motorcycles and went out to Johnson Valley with tents wrapped around the back of the seats, um, like tent bags, uh, hammocks, uh, w anything that had sleeping bags, whatever. And they lived off of their motorcycle. And I was like, this is overlanding with motorcycles but they had like knobby tires they were going off road they were trail riding adventure bikes man and, well these were not adventure bikes <laughs> these, all right they're these, they're one of them i'm pretty sure was a, was a was a cut up like harley sportster uh but it was really oh, cool geez. to see that like the off grid off pavement grab whatever you can to to go camp out under the stars for a couple nights and get out of town uh i think that in itself is is expanding beyond just the off-road community and it's inviting more people in, which I think is actually really cool. Uh, Cause who's to say those guys aren't going to get into a Jeep soon or anything like that. That's also very customizable, put their personality into that build and then get into the off-road scene as well. Um, I mean, I think a pretty cool overlanding rig would also encompass a motorcycle or an adventure bike on the back. <laughs> so you can Ooh, recon and idea. scout and then, yeah. and then ride that's around. I don't know. That, I think that'd be pretty cool. 
Well, dude, the bikes are the it's a huge thing on the bikes, the adventure bikes. I mean, you got oh yeah. Uh, for those of you listening, you thought, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to overlanding. I'm not gonna learn anything today. Let me let me learn you a little something. <laughs> uh, go out and Google the backcountry discovery routes, uh, oh, yeah. the BDR, and they are routes all over the country. There's Mid Atlantic. There's the Colorado one. They are all over the country, and they were originally designed for adventure bikes. That's where it came out. That's what the BDR is all about. But most of the BDRs now have grown to where they are, they are routes that can and and quite often do. Like I know the Mid Atlantic one does, and the Colorado one does. Um, they encompass you know trails and roads that are wide enough for vehicles. And most of these routes, they're all different. Some of them have zero pavement. Um, some of them have some pavement, but they're all designed to get out and kind of be like the, like the name suggests, backcountry discovery. So there's a lot of off road. There's some on road. There are ways to do it kind of without overlanding where there's a little bed and breakfast and whatever, but most of them are designed to be vehicle-based adventure travel. Um, so if you haven't heard of that before, BDR, Backcountry Discovery Route, um, that is a good way to get into overlanding too because you can buy the routes. You don't have to worry about you know, getting lost and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that was started with the adventure bike crowd, um, I think, whew, longer ago than we're even talking about. You know, we talked talking about the last five, ten years. These guys have been doing it at least 10, 15, maybe – and, and longer than that in some cases yeah probably since the what was it the kawasaki was it the dr 600 400 yeah a lot the, of these guys the first know, the bmw one of the first ones popular bikes there's that a lot of out. them mm -hmm. yeah yeah but they're super cool well hell yeah i'm definitely gonna look that up because uh that sounds like something i might just want to check out there one weekend go. and just learn something little, so learn something every day absolutely we're not gonna go rock crawling in the four by e but i'll i'll definitely take it on some on some gravel Absolutely. Roads in the middle of nowhere. And there's one right sure. here in North Carolina, the Mid-Atlantic goes right oh, to North Carolina. There we go. I'll it's freaking it out. beautiful. I've done some pieces of it. It's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. So talking about vehicles though, so I think one of the things that we can absolutely talk about that separates rock crawling from overlanding is the style of vehicle build. Um those those two things are built very differently for obvious, very different purposes. Um, what are we seeing as like the most commonly used suspension setups or armor or build out for an overlanding purpose, purposeful rig? I, you know, they, there's not as much stuff that you do to an overlanding vehicle generally when it comes to suspension and whatnot. I mean, you can, a lot of these vehicles now can be perfectly fine. Cause when you're talking about overlanding, you're talking about gravel roads, dirt roads, dirt trails. You know, you're not talking about rock crawling. So the vehicle doesn't really need to be as capable from that aspect. It really just needs to be it's more load handling stuff. So you see a lot of guys changing out rear suspensions, beefing up rear suspensions. Maybe we're doing a regular lift kit, but we're kind of altering the parts in the rear. You know, if you've got a truck or a leaf spring style, we're doing an add a leaf or we're making it a little more, um, you know, where if it was if it didn't have anything in it, the back would be totally jacked up. But because it's going to have a bed rack or it's going to have a rooftop or a drawer system or a slide or something like that, and you're adding five, six, seven hundred pounds, that's something that we do. Rock Crawler right now is in testing. I think it's coming out pretty soon. They're testing a Gladiator suspension that has uh, air ride. And there is an automatic function to that as well, I think, that's being worked on to where it kind of maintains a set, a set ride level. So I do the same thing in my truck. I have airbags with a compressor in my truck. So that when I'm completely loaded, I can move that, you know, move it up and down. I actually can use it left to right to kind of level level the rooftop tent. Um, so I think that's kind of the most important thing is load handling because you are, mm -hmm. you know, when you're going out backpacking, it's all about ounces, right? How many grams am I carrying? I don't want to pack right. over, you know, when I was, I think when I go out backpacking, I try to keep a pack under like 28 pounds. And that's considered a really, really light pack. Right. When I'm going overlanding, it's, you know, four or five hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm bringing the scottle and I'm bringing the rooftop. You know, there's all this kind of stuff that you're bringing. So I think weight. Don't forget handling, the jet boil. <laughs> well, duh, of course. And if you don't know what a jet boil is, turn off this podcast. <laughs> um, love those. At things. least an AeroPress. So. <laughs> oh. See, now you're getting a little bougie, a little bougie. See, I do like the little Kuju pour over. I get the jet bottle, a little Kuju. Oh, coffee. yeah. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, I think weight handling is number one and, and mild. I mean, certainly you can get crazy. Um, certainly you can get nuts on suspension, but you don't need to, it's more about load handling and how am I going to carry rooftop tents, awnings, food, you know, stuff to prepare the food 
extra clothing and all that kind of stuff, depending on, and now we've even got, you know, solar panels and generators and all that. But I think that's going to be the main thing. And then everything else is kind of built around that where with rock crawling, it's let's build everything around how big of a tire you're going to go with um, overlanding. Not it's, it's really based over how long are you going out for? Are you a two, three night on the weekend guy? Like most East coasters are, cause we don't have as much, we don't have as much open space here on the East coast or are you a, a week long guy out on, uh, on the West coast or, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you want to go and just completely disconnect from society for, a month at a time and your only limiting factor is fuel. I don't, you know, whatever it is. So I think once you had that conversation, you, you figure out the build. So it's just different. Um, but I think that's, you know, it should be different. It's a completely different goal. Yeah. And I like absolutely. Both. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what vehicles are you seeing like more commonly used? I know there's, we've seen everything from, Subarus to Sprinter vans, but uh, for someone that's looking to get into overlanding, what are the uh, what what kind of vehicles a good base to start with? Yeah, there's certainly the 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 minor part of the market that is you know run what you brought right. You know, there's old this old truck or that old SUV, and and that is certainly a part of the market. But I think when you get into the bigger you know kind of the meat of the market, um, th- the Gladiator really has kind of come in strong in the last three or four years. The Tacoma's always been there. That's always a big one. That's always super popular. Um, The Forerunner is a a big one. I think to an extent you see Bronco and Wrangler. Um, The reason maybe you see trucks more is just because of uh, rooftop tents and awnings. It's a little bit easier to build out a truck bed um, than it is, you know, a hardtop Wrangler or something like that. Um, So I think most of what you're going to see – is is that you're going to see the gladiator you're going to see the tacoma obviously there's a lot more vehicles but i think those are going to be your most too popular probably followed by i haven't seen the bronco doing it a lot i i do know it's getting that way as as more and more parts become available um but wrangler's still certainly up there but yeah i'd say tacoma and gladiator are the ones um that i would see the most of right now it, that yeah. was that was Just, different three four years ago but it's definitely the case now yeah. i think and naturally, just because you've got a, a small mid-sized pickup truck that's pretty mm-hmm. decent mm-hmm. on fuel, it's got a good size bed. It's just kind of really easy to do those. Um, Forerunners, I'm seeing a lot more of. Yeah. Actually, when I was out in Tennessee uh, the other weekend at the little show and shine they had, um, they actually asked me to be a judge because I was from out of state. Uh, they're like, hey, try to be as you know non-biased as possible. You know what a good build looks like. We're looking for form and function. Um, you know, let's you don't know any of these people you're not connected to this jeep group like we'll let you be a judge i was like oh hell yeah so i'm walking around and uh one of the categories was best non-jeep or non-wrangler and uh there were some really cool uh there were some really cool builds out there um and i'm looking around and i'm like man this is eh, these are all about the same then out of nowhere this newer generation forerunner pops out on 37 king coilovers uh New control arms, tubular uppers, looked like long travel, uh, but fully kitted out for overlanding. Rooftop tent, extra fuel, spare tire, refrigerator inside, basically a full kitchen that he could pull, like slide out on a drawer. Uh, Starlink was attached to it. Like it was I think rad. I was <laughs> I think it was ready to rock. And, and the more I looked at it and like, I mean, there was some money in that thing. Like there were like the, the, Coilovers were king adjustable reservoir coilovers. Actually, I should say that like they were not just your standard oh, toss them in coilover. <laughs> they were the full adjustable ones, and I'm like, I would do some serious wheeling in this thing, but at the same time, it looked comfortable enough that I would probably bring Brittany or or somebody with me and be perfectly fine to camp and wheel. And and I mean that one was built out pretty pretty big. That was impressive, but that one won the uh the non wrangler non jeep category for sure see that uh and especially a a forerunner on 37s is hard enough to see but when you see all those things the detail build to go along with it you're like that dude cares he's put money into it and he's thought about exactly the type of terrain that he wants to run on this thing and uh that's cool i love seeing very well thought out builds whether it's a sprinter van fully loaded out in a lift kit and altering tires or just something that everyone's thinking about that 
you're pretty self-sufficient no matter where you go. And of course, I'm a big fan of Starlink. So seeing a Starlink on on something, and this one was was the new flat yep. panel. I uh, forget the company in California that's doing the retrofits. Um, it's a 12 volt system. It's not a satellite dish anymore. It's it's completely flat. And uh, I was talking to the guy after the show, and he's like, "Yeah, dude, he's like, I can go like 80 miles an hour and still get I've seen full those connection." connection. Freaking sweet. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, this is this is awesome." Uh, and I feel like that was kind of more of a hybrid build built for for both. Um, but as, as far as like the overlanding aspect, that dude looked like he could be out there for a right. month at a time, and he yeah. was prepared for it. Um, which is which is pretty pretty freaking cool to me. So glad to see forerunners are are kind of hitting that scene pretty hard. Like you said, gladiators and Tacomas have been there for a little bit. Tacomas have been there oh, yeah. for a while. Oh, yeah. um, but I mean, I mean, this has really gotten. I think I I first heard the term overlanding. I want to say in around 2014, um, and it's just grown from there. It's like, what do you think caused? the the explosion of of the overland COVID. vehicle 100 percent covid i, was 100, I, I mean there was, there's just no that. doubt Absolutely. covid did it um you know i i can just look at the outlaw off-road locations in in what was mm-hmm. sold maybe overland related prior to covid and then you look at you know mid 2020 to mid 2021 and the amount of rooftop tents that moved out of the stores it, it baffles the mind like we could not it was every day some we were on the phone with some rooftop supplier begging for more product like when's the next container coming in when can we get five more tents when can we get three more pallets and that was you know per location so um it was absolutely insane and and i get it right like the world was going crazy people you know some states were completely locking down and you know what do you do if you don't want to be locked in your freaking house getting cabin fever because that's a thing you you outfit your you outfit your vehicle as well as you can and you get off grid because that's the one place that covid didn't matter covid doesn't matter in the middle of you know sub southeastern utah where there's no buildings for 100 miles so everything outdoors and and rock crawling did the same thing backpack anything outdoors but i think you know, wheeling and out and off-roading was a thing before and already had a very, very big market or had a place. Backpacking, same thing. Mountain biking, all that stuff had been around for years and years and decades and decades. Overlanding was still kind of young and it became a thing like, you know, I got a car. You know, I, I you know, it's kind of that next step from car camping and it just kind of, it kind of, it, it just, the timing was perfect. You know, you like car camping, but I don't want to car camp because I don't want to stay in one place because I'm trying to get out of town because I don't want to deal with COVID crap. So I'm going to go, but I want to keep moving and I want to go see all these places. And then remote working came in during COVID. So if you have satellite and you have solar and you have all this, you can work from the middle of Montana or whatever. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, and that's still a little bit to this day, not not as much as it was obviously during COVID people were turning back to the office. But I think for sure it was just a. It was definitely a timing thing, but when you added in that COVID thing with the timing and people going to remote work and all the things that came about because of COVID, um, it 1,000% launched. It launched countless overland companies. Um, it definitely put us into the overland game big time at Outlaw Off-Road um, to where to it to market we stay into this day. Um, and it's just now, especially out west, it's continued to grow. I think it's changed a little bit since COVID, but it's still much bigger now than it was pre-2020 for sure. Yeah. And I think something else that would contribute to that, and I know COVID and the lockdowns like really push that get outside, let's just go get out of the house, go do something. But I think there was actually a, I don't want to call it a spiritual aspect of this, but a realization that while COVID was going on, people were lose, losing loved ones uh, left and right. And so I think it was kind of one of those things that were like, you know, if if this is all the time I've got, I want to go see this stuff and and just get out and, and kind of just make a bucket list of places to go see. And during that time, I mean, national parks were empty, um, the ones that were open anyways. Uh, landmarks, historical landmarks, highways. I don't think I've ever like seen less traffic yeah. in my life around the Charlotte area. Um so like you said, it was really the kind of the perfect storm to breed a new kind of adventure-based travel. 
Um, and I think just the love for the outdoors and getting back to roots kind of helped push that as well, which I think, again, super cool. Hate that it happened during during COVID or COVID was the catalyst for that. Um, but now I'm just glad that we see a lot more people enjoying outdoors and enjoying a non-sedentary lifestyle. Um, and then that's true for me too. I, I really embrace getting outside and, and I've been a part of Jeeps for, you know, since 2011. Um, but I really found a love for being outdoors and just get this itch to be like, if it's nice and above 60 degrees, I'm like, I want right. to be outside. hundred <laughs> percent. Absolutely. I just want to be yeah. out there. So just look for reasons to be outside. <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like yesterday, the, uh, well, this is a post eclipse day. Uh, oh, but geez. yesterday Can I'm sitting not? outside. I'm just like, Hey, the, the <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to sit outside and like squint at the sun for a little bit just cause it was a nice and on day. This episode <laughs> of dirt to dust. We talk about the eclipse for 45 minutes. No, oh, I, I don't. No, I saw people no, posting, no I guess, <laughs> they were posting on Facebook about driving, literally leaving their homes and driving hours and hours and hours. Just I I can't and here I am freaking so talking about it. to go see the eclipse. Damn it! You said I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> yeah, it was it was very uh, it was an anticlimactic in North. Carolina. Well, absolutely. I was in my oh. office and I was working <laughs> and I didn't, dude. I didn't even. I totally messed up the time. I thought it was supposed to happen at like two thirty. So at like ten minutes to three, I look outside and it's a little bit dark. And I'm like, oh crap! I missed the eclipse. Let me go out there and see it. I go out there and I look up and I kind of do my little thing. So I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't want to burn my retinas. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's only like a quarter. Okay, cool. Let me go back in my office. I had a phone call. I had a I had a three o'clock phone call I had to be on. So I was like, okay, let me go back on my phone. And then didn't think anything else of it. And then the wife asked me last night, we're at my son's hockey practice. She goes, Did you see the eclipse? And I and I told her that story. She goes, Um, do you realize it was like the eclipse was like after three, not before three? I was like, Wait, <laughs> <Yeah>. what? <laughs> I wonder if it was like three eleven was peak or she something. Yeah, she's like, it, it was, was after three. You were actually watching it start. I was like, Man, <laughs> I totally missed it. I just went back into my office like nothing was going on and got back on the phone with another right. meeting. And I'm like, I mean, it was basically crap, just totally a cloudy it, day. But- I mean, it, it really wasn't that great. But I know there were two Facebook groups in particular that had there. I mean, they're overlanding based Facebook groups. This is why I brought this up. Just not just leading down a rabbit hole for no reason. <laughs> uh, but two Facebook groups and they were putting together a convoy to um to go to the path of totality and uh i think they're going out to ohio i want to say but i mean they had 10 12 vehicles and they were planning on going out for a couple days and like Mm -mm. bringing out every every single thing that they possibly had uh let's go overland that's how we bring it back to overlanding let's go overlanding overlanding for the the eclipse I mean, whatever your reason is for getting outdoors and and taking that path less traveled and, and getting off the road, whether it be eclipse or whether it's just because you want to go see the mountains for the weekend or there's a, a great white buffalo in the plains of Montana that you want to go search for. I mean, whatever your reason, uh, it's still cool. Uh, I think there's definitely a market for it. And even I, I would like to say post COVID, like I think you and I had the same itch and we got in the same group on a on a little trek ourselves and went out and hit all five major national parks in Utah uh, and trying to hit as little road as possible. So I think that's when the overlanding bug kind of hit me. I didn't get like full fledged into it, but it definitely gave me a new perspective. And I was like, okay, this is actually pretty fun. Like I I enjoyed that minus not showering for like a week, but (laughs) you (laughs) saw it on that trip. That that was the trip (laughs) that we filmed um, unparalleled. And you saw on that trip, we had every build level, right? Like we had the camera guys in the rental. Absolutely. With no rooftop, no awning, <laughs> none of that. We had, no. that was the trip. I was in like the fully built Tacoma with like my own kitchen and the slide out and the rooftop. Like I was, com- I did not need anybody else for anything else. No. Uh-uh. And then we had the one dude that was in his Wrangler JL with the Patriot camper that had, that made me look bad. And then we had the family and the forerunner, no rooftop tent. Like we had every possible rig, but yet everybody did it. Um, we even had Johan from Go Mammoth. He was there with his built out um, gladiator. He had the gladiator. He had a gladiator. Had the old guy he was in the, 40s. What was the Mitsubishi Montero we had out there, too? Yeah. So, yeah, Montero. We had was even a full size Ram. Absolutely. Like 2,500 Ram. And we actually did a little bit of trail riding out there. I There were some <laughs> trails fault. that we did that, that, was, that I was nice. not <laughs> expecting to see overland vehicles on. Yeah, I think it kind of made some of the guys nervous. But for me, <laughs> I was in the rental ring. Everybody like, made it with okay. the camera crew. <laughs> the guys in the camera crew were like 
they went from driving the trails because they they love overlanding and we hit started hitting like the rocky section of the trail and they're like uh caleb we need you to drive we don't we don't want to do this <laughs> Look, so here i am bombing around in the rental ring i was told <laughs> i was told very clearly by the group by the by the group by the organizers we'll say to find campsite um i found a campsite that's all i'm gonna i mean i found a campsite it was a granted it was at the bottom of a rocky ridge that everybody had to get down but we made it, hey. and everybody was fine. I mean, look, the Tacoma made it no fi- no problem. It was fine. So I knew I knew the Wrangler would would make it. The only thing I was worried about was a full size Ram twenty five hundred, fully yeah, loaded know. down. You know, uh, but it even it made fine. it, and it was a cool spot. And it's actually a spot. I mean, I've been to Moab for several years. That section of trail and that that part off the highway that we went onto, I had never even heard of before. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, that would be a good little little run for like a little quick day trip. Um. In May. So for North those of you Moab. that don't know, this where we're talking about is in Moab. It's north on 191 of Moab. Uh, it's the Klondike, yeah. Klondike something, but the Kl- I just call it That's the Klondike Trails. I was completely missing the name. And there's a bunch of little trails back there. There's a bunch of little dirt roads, and it's basically this this one little ridge line um, that runs over to the backside of Arches National Park, which is Sun Valley. Um, so in front of this is 191 and some camping, and then you've got this ridge, and on the other side of the ridge is Sun Valley. And there's this little dirt road that goes into the backside of Arches because we actually woke up the next morning. We drive out of camp. We take a right and a football field. We're in the backside mm-hmm. of Arches National Forest. And I'd been there before, so I kind of knew how to get there. But there's some really cool. It's really open, really wide, really flat. But the trail that we were referring to, it got really rocky, was called Baby Steps. And um, yeah, yeah, that was on the kind of the outer edge of the Klondike Trail system. So if you've been to Moab, it's a cool, it's a little cool spot to go to if you've kind of bend all the trails you want to do something it's it's a few minutes north of moab you pass it if you're coming in from i-70 uh it, you actually pass it on your left just a few miles before um you get to uh gemini bridges which is the kind of parking area with the porta potties on the right mm-hmm. which is about 10 miles 10 minutes north of moab it's just a little bit north back of that and that's that's the entrance to like metal masher right right right, right, think, right. yeah and gold bar rim side um right you know the back side yeah the lucky yeah, chicken yeah yeah the, yeah the, 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 booby, the, the booby bird foot or whatever that is i just drive over the, i just know to drive over it so but a really really cool area and out there again if you've got on x off road you've got guy gps um for you overlanders you know exactly what i'm talking about those are those are maps that will show you all these trails too and you know the great thing about moab and the blm land if you can see it and it's not fenced you can drive on it it's yours you can yeah. it is yours it is yours so really really cool area if you haven't checked it out definitely go check it out and a lot of areas out there to overland as well you can go miles and miles and miles and not see anybody oh absolutely so you uh i think you mentioned what what, what was the term you mentioned earlier uh race landing race landing. race landing i like it <laughs> yeah i like it uh what are some other combinations we can throw here uh what, what are we going to call the future of the combination of the two if there if there is truly a combination of the two, or do you think they're going to I stay think separate? There is, I think there is. We we did a build several years ago at Outlaw, and it was uh, it was one of our first. It may have been one of the first uh, Hemi conversions that we did in the JL uh, when that came out. Uh, Dakota is one of one of the first Dakota Customs ones that 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 we did for sure, and I think that anybody did. And it was it was way it was it was a twenty eighteen that we converted, and this build was. Yes, it was a Hemi conversion. It got axle swapped. It got 40s. It got armor. It got winch. It got all all of the things that you would typically think in a kind of a rock crawling build. Mm -hmm. Um, But then we threw a goose gear storage system in the back. We threw a rear seat delete at it for storage, and we threw a rooftop tent and a rack on it. Um, And we called it Project Rocklander. Ooh. I like that. <laughs> so the idea for this customer was he lives in Kentucky and he goes, he drives it all over the place. And this was going to kind of be his early retirement present to himself. And he said, you know, I, I, he owns his own company and he was kind of getting out of that. And he said, I just want to go. I want to go wheel all of these Jeep badge of honor trails, but I want to do it with the Jeep. And I thought that was back then. I thought that was a really cool idea. Like you can drive this Jeep to all of these badge of honor trails. You can camp at trailhead. You can camp, whatever you're not spending to 150 to 250 dollars a night on hotels and all these restaurants you're overlanding trail to trail but then when you get to the trail you're running the trail and the jeep's built properly to do that and i think i've seen a lot of jeeps and other vehicles out on trails 
that are doing that. They're putting, you know, they've got the, the camping stuff in the back. You know, we did it with Rock Crawler years ago where, you know, I took the Wrangler out there. We did some of the trail and we camped, we camped on the Rubicon. That's rock landing to me. You know, I had all of my camping gear in the Wrangler. We wheeled, we wheeled, we wheeled, we stopped, we camped. We wheeled, we wheeled, we wheeled, we stopped, we camped. We wheeled, and we did that for five days. Um, we had one little break in Reno in the middle to fix stuff because we, you know, people would break stuff. But when we were out on those trails, save that one night in the middle, you know, we were basically rock landing. And I think for me, I, you know, if you do it the right way and you build the vehicle the right way, I love that combination. I absolutely love it. Um, that was one of the, that was one of my favorite trips that I had ever done. Uh, I really did like that trip that we talked about earlier with the unparalleled filming with that, with that Tacoma. I just really like that. I like yeah. doing the overlanding. I like seeing a lot of stuff, you know, it was like why I did a cruise, you know, I could have, we could have just flown to Belize mm -hmm. and stayed there for a week or flown to Roatan and stayed there for a week, but we didn't, we got on a boat and we were able to go to Costa Maya, Mexico. And then we get back on the boat and they take us, you know, we go down the coast, we go to Roatan, Honduras. Then we go to Belize. Then we go back to Cozumel and then we go back and then we come home. I was all, I was gone a week. It, it cost me about the same, but because I was traveling in between my destinations, I got to see more. And because of that, I got to see three different countries. I got to see two different spots in Mexico. I got to go to Belize and I got to go to Honduras, which I would not have been able to do had I not kind of done you know, the cruise kind of is the boat version of adventure travel. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just thought that was really cool. So if you translate that to dirt, that is overlanding, mm -hmm. right? You know, we're traveling, you know, a little bit during the day, we're going hundred miles, 150 miles, 200 miles, whatever you're doing. And then I'm seeing something new that afternoon and that evening and I'm camping out. Maybe I stay for two days. Maybe I stay for one, but however long you stay, you're seeing more. And, you know, it's weird is the more and more I see of the United States, the more and more I want to see. Yeah. You know, I yeah. go and I see stuff and they're like, well, have you been here? I was like, well, man, I missed that on that trip. Now I want to go back and you start writing mm -hmm. all this stuff down. And you just want to go see it. And I think overlanding is just a really, really cool way to do it. Yeah, However absolutely. you do it. However you're yeah, equipped I, to do I think, it. I think the U.S. gets a, a lot of hate for people not traveling outside the country, but then they don't realize how big and how vast this country is and how right. different it is not just from state to state, but from time zone to time zone and from region to region. Uh, I want to say there was some, there was a new map put out a couple, I want to say two or three years ago that was based on cultural and environmental regions. And it subsected the United States. I want to say into like 16 different sub areas. Wouldn't surprise where me. Where that, that had they not have a name on them, you would think that they are completely different countries. Um, and then that, that, kind of brings me to the point of you, you nailed it on like right there being able to travel and seeing more once you to lead you to see more. Um, but on that same trip, we were able to see, um, I'm blinking on the name now here, uh, something city, uh, that we found, I found oh, swing on a map on the way swing arm city. Yeah. And that's probably one of the coolest places I've seen in person. It doesn't look real. Yeah. Um, especially in pictures, you're like, how the hell are people doing this? And you get out there, you're like, okay, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty difficult. Uh, and it wasn't but like wheeling, you know, it was just an open gravel pit basically, but it was cool. It looked like without it was another giving planet. up though. I mean, what city, there's no cities near there. Like, it's right. not like you're going to go, if you go to Moab and you want to go to swing arm city, you're giving up an entire day because you have to go all the way up to 70 over across to green Gulch or green river, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. then you got to go down and over to whatever that town that starts with the H. You're, it's like a two and a half hour, three hour ride from Moab. So you're giving up an entire day mm -hmm. where if you're overlanding, like we were, we it's right just through. a stop on the trip. <laughs> yeah. We were, you just make that part of the route and you're right. like, Hey, I can go five minutes out of my way and go see this super cool spot and continue on. And that's exactly what we did that day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we were going park to park. I think you had seen an Instagram video of, you know, Ken block rest in peace. Yep. yep. He had just been there. And we said, man, that just looks super cool. And and it was absolutely super cool. And, um, right and we would have way. never done that. Like, I've I've been to Moab countless times. Never had I gone the three-hour trip to Swing mm -hmm. Arm City. Only because we were overlanding did I know that that existed and then also had the time I was able to adjust the route appropriately to go be able to see it. So, And there was yeah. all kinds of times like that during that trip where we woke up in the morning and all we knew was where we had to get to. Yeah. No clue that's how it. We we're gonna get there. We, we you know, that we was going. it. It was like, and that was by design. It wasn't because we were yeah. unprepared. It was like, this is what we want to do. We know where mm -hmm. we're starting. We know where we're going. 
let's just let's figure it out, guys. Let's just figure it out. And I think that was and you can obviously super plan it. This is not my kind of deal. But I, that was so much fun to do that it was just like, look, I know what I got. I know where I got to get to. <laughs> yeah. I'll <laughs> At an approximate to, uh... time frame. Right. I'll have to pull up some pictures and maybe overlay it onto this podcast for the people viewing on YouTube. We'll pull a Rogan. Hey, Jamie, pull up the picture. <laughs> do it. Do it, man. Uh, Caleb, pull but, up the pictures. No, because I've, I've got some really cool it images was so amazing. from that trip, yeah. and especially of Swing Arm City, that I want to I want to make sure people know what we're talking about. I don't want to like overpopulate the place, but I got some awesome pictures of that Tacoma. I got some awesome pictures of the group there. And without seeing it, like it's it's so hard to describe what that place is. Um, so I'll overlay some images on when this video comes out on YouTube. Um, but that's, that's pretty cool. Um, believe it or not, I actually went down the path of for a little bit there. I I'm not sure if I'm totally convinced this is how I want to do it with the LJ. I strongly consider doing like a rock landing build mm -hmm. with the LJ. I thought about turning it into a truck cause I owned the, uh, before the JL, but this is well before you knew me. I had a JK 2007 JK Rubicon that I did axles and everything to 40s that I had the opportunity for pretty low cost. It was a new kit on the market uh, to turn it into a truck. Um, so I basically cut the back half of the roll bar off, uh, closed in the section, the the rear door section, did a bed, uh, it was a drop-in bed. So I wasn't like cutting the body in half or anything right, like right. that. It was just taking the existing four door and turning it into a truck. And it was cool. I loved it. Um, and so part of me was like, man, what if I designed a roll cage and a half cab to put a rooftop tent on the back of the LJ, run the 43s or whatever, big gas tire, and just go bomb around and, and camp out of the LJ. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I can cut up the LJ like that. <laughs> I like the combination. But I, you know, I don't, I don't put it's myself, still, it's still an option. I don't put myself in one camp. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm equally comfortable you know, kind of race landing in the pickup uh, as I am in a race car in the desert, as I am rock crawling at Windrock, as I am, you know, overlanding in Utah. I think, like you said, I just want to be, I don't like to be home. It's just not, it's not my personality, man. It's just not like I will look for stuff. I would, li I would literally rather go grab my camper and that, cause I have a full on camper too, like the family truckster RV. I would legit, go grab my camper, hook it to the truck and drive 50 miles, stay in my own backyard and go camping for the weekend. I would do that. It doesn't bother me at all versus just sit at home and, and do stuff. I would literally just live out of the camper for the weekend just because it's just who I am. And I think a lot of people are like that. I think that's the natural. I think that's the natural human condition. I think, you know, de millennia or, you know, thousands of years, hundreds of years of, of kind of, I don't know, learning to be stationary. I don't think that's in our DNA. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the default human. You know, they were all humans were always nomads. Humans were always travelers. Humans were always adventurers. You think if human, you know, if humans started in one place on this earth, humans did not start everywhere all over all at once, no matter what, no, <laughs> no matter what religious theology you believe in humans did not start as a billion people spread out across the globe. That's not how we came to be. Um, we did that. We, we became multi-continental, multi, you know, all over this world, covering every corner of this planet because we went on adventures because they, you know, because they took horseback and went overlanding you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. You know, you think about the, the military campaigns of, uh, of the ancient times, you know, these, these guys were gone on military campaigns for five, 10, 15 years. It wasn't like, oh, I got a six month deployment. And I'm coming back. These guys were marching, you know, Alexandria, that, that empire was thousands, two to 3000 miles in width. And those guys that, that wasn't because he sent an email and said, we, we, we rule you now. No, they marched 2000 miles and fought and, and camped every night on military campaigns that spend, you know, well over a decade to make that happen. So I think that's the natural thing is for humans to want to go, want to go do stuff. So was the, the Roman empire, the, the first overland? I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I was going to give it to Alexander the great. I was going to give it to Alexander, but then I guess you got, cut, no, but even some, before Alexander some knobs into the, the chariots, but really before <laughs> even Alexander, there was the Persians. Cause he knocked off, 
you know, when he left Macedonia, right, that was a very, very small little nothing. Right. And he went and tried to take over Persia. Yep. So, I mean, who was it? Who did it first? I don't know. But <laughs> I think we are def we are definitely not the first to overland for sure. I, it's no, been going on uh, for thousands and thousands of years, y'all. It's been out there. So we got rock landing. Uh, I'm just trying to rattle some names off here. Race landing. Over crawling. Over cr- Race landing, yeah. overland rock traversing. Over traversing. <laughs> I just think I think we just uh, got to get. I think we just got to get away from the terms. It's all off road to me. I think you can rock nomad. Jeez, oh, <laughs> you're trying to subdivide it up in the 16 areas like you did with the map. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just trying to see what we can do to coin this as a as a thing, uh, and and try to make it official. Maybe I'll I'll design a t shirt. Actually, actually, let's I think do my this. thing was the rock landing. So, I think if you're going to do something like that, I, I think we got to go some form of rock landing. If you're wanting to do like coin a phrase, make it a thing, do the T-shirt, make a sticker, do something like that. Yeah, I think you got to go. I think you got to go with rock landing. I, I think rock landing would win, but I'm curious to know, like, so if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever uh, channel you are watching this through, drop us a line and tell us what you would call this and if it gets enough votes or we get enough feedback on like the same term uh i'll make it i'll design a shirt maybe we'll get some stuff away i'll do that i'll 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 design something something and make it cool uh because i think like i said i think it's a really cool hybrid area of the market and it's something that i'm very interested in as well of of doing both uh i'm not i don't really want to put the lj on a trailer and beat it up every single weekend until i break stuff and do the hardest trails i can possibly run but at the same time i don't want to just stay on yep. the dirt roads and not use it to its full capability um so yeah i like we'll, it uh, we'll, we'll we'll try to coin it and do something like that but i think i think we've pretty well covered the overlanding versus uh off-roading debate here i don't think there's really a debate of which one's better or which one's it they're both different things but they both have their place and i feel very strongly that as we see the world of off-roading progressing, I think we're going to see a lot more of that hybrid rock landing like that, just doing both and just continuing to get off the grid. Uh, Cause I think that is now ingrained in us post COVID of like, Hey, we got to get outside. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think and it was kind of going away from that. I think COVID kind of helped that. Um, unfortunately I see it going back to the way it was before, but uh, yeah, that's just the mentality. I don't understand. You got to get outside, man. Like oxygen, vitamin D, let's go. Let's get out there. Whether it's rock crawling, overlanding, rock landing, racing, race landing, it doesn't freaking matter. Just freaking car camp. Like go find a cool camping spot at the river somewhere and just go camp and hike, man. Like that's the OG, you know, go, go, go base camp and go backpacking, go mountain bike camping, go adventure biking. Like we talked about, check out the BDR. The BDR is freaking sweet. Um, if you're out there and you want to try your hand at overlanding and stuff and you don't have all the gear and you just want to go buy a bunch of stuff at Walmart and throw it in the back of your Wrangler, check out the BDR. Absolutely check out the BDR. They've got the maps you can download. You don't have to worry about getting lost. You don't, you know, it's a great way to dip your toe into the overlanding world um, and do it in an organized, safe, and, and, and legal way. I mean, obviously, we want to be safe. We want to be legal. We don't want to be, especially on the East Coast, you don't want to be trespassing on to private land. You want to stay, you know, follow the tread lightly principles. You want to stay on legal land. Good. If you're out West, like we said earlier, if you can see it and it's not gated, you know, it's yours. <laughs> it's a little bit different, which is why you kind of tend to see the big long-term overland builds out West and some of the more weekend warrior type oriented stuff on the East coast, certainly not exclusive to each coast, but that's certainly what you see more of. So, um, and I'm here for it, man. I'm here for that. I'm here for more of it. Um, I, I love all of it. I, I love to be able to camp. I just want to be outside, and I think overlanding is a big part of it. So um, I do like the idea of the T-shirt. My vote, Rocklander, everybody else, Spotify, Apple Podcast, all that. Put your votes in. Make some comments on YouTube. Comment it up. Let's see. Let's see who wins. If we get enough feedback, like like Caleb said, we'll definitely – we'll do a T-shirt. We'll do something. We'll give, we'll give it away or something. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll have some fun with it for sure. Yep, for sure. So, yeah, I'm good with leaving it there. Ask for the uh, audience participation. So, um, the 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 only other thing I will say is, as I always say, thank you to everyone who's watching. Thank you Absolutely. to everyone who's listening. We appreciate each and every one of you uh, for taking some time out of your day, your afternoon, your evening, and listening or watching us in whatever form or fashion you choose to do so. So, thank you. Uh, if you are new to the podcast, go back, check out the other episodes. 
uh, like us, subscribe, um, you know, drop a comment, drop a rating on Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere, man. We're on the Google Play. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on YouTube. You can go to uh, we're presented and sponsored by Outlaw Offroad. You can go to the main Outlaw Offroad website at theoutlawoffroad.com. Um, always we'll have the most three recent, I believe. Is that right, Ken? Three? Three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Three most recent. We'll always have the three most recent podcasts, including the mailbag, which drops every Friday, uh, including these episodes, these main episodes, which drop every Wednesday. So definitely check those out. Get involved. Get interactive. We get our mailbag, mailbag questions. You got a question you want answered. All that stuff is open and fair game. So that was it. That's all I got. That's where we're going to leave awesome. it with overlanding and all that. Uh, be sure to catch back up with us Friday for another mailbag episode. And as I said at the beginning, at the top of this episode, we do have an interview scheduled. Uh, depending on Caleb's editing schedule, uh, we will either have that up next week or the week following. And our interview will be with Mr. Andy Perry from Steer Smart. Awesome. Yep. Oh, Love Andy, known him for a long time, known the company for a long time, been working with Steer Smarts for, you know, we talked about COVID today since before COVID. Um, mm-hmm. And those guys have always been awesome to me, awesome to work with from Outlaw Off-Road, as well as from a personal standpoint. They've got a couple bits and parts and pieces on 4699, the Ultra 4 race car. So really excited mm-hmm. to get Andy on here with us and talk to him. And again, we'll either drop that episode uh, next Wednesday, which I believe next Wednesday will be the 17th, or we'll drop it the following Wednesday. But we will definitely have it out to you guys in the month of April. So that is where we will leave it today. Once again, thank you to everyone. Appreciate you guys sticking around uh, and watching us on our little podcast, Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Offroad. And we'll see you on the next episode. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Offroad. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.